What is a Grand Tourer? Well, it's a very old-fashioned but also simple concept. You see, a Grand Tourer is designed to be the kind of car that is just as good at taking you and your family down to the Amalfi Coast as it is hooning around the Stelvio Pass. It's a very simple idea, but not a very easy one to execute. You see, to be a true Grand Tourer, a car has to combine an awful lot of often contradictory qualities. It should have luxury and speed, handling and refinement, road presence, but also class. It's a very, very difficult thing to get right, but it's important to understand what a Grand Tourer is when a company goes and puts those words in the name of its car. This is the all-new Bentley Continental GT, and because it is all-new, we are going to be giving it a very thorough review. I'm going to look at the exterior, the interior, then out on the road, the engine, chassis, and finally see if they can all come together in one harmonious package, because that is what it's going to take to make this what Bentley claim it to be, the finest Grand Tourer in the world. Now, just in case you think that because I've been given a 207 mile an hour palace for the weekend, then I'm going to go easy on the Bentley, you are very wrong. You see, I never liked the old Continental GT. It was a weird car. It looked far too soft and wobbly. It was too heavy to be a sports car. It was too cramped to be luxurious. And worst of all, footballers bought them. Now, in fairness, I never actually drove one, but it was never, ever a car that I wanted to. The new Continental GT's transformation reminds me of the scene you'll often see in a film, where there's the scientist lady that we all know is actually Megan Fox with glasses on, but none of her colleagues seem to realise the fact that she's one of the most beautiful women on the planet, until she suddenly takes her glasses off and lets her hair down, and then they suddenly realise that they've been working with a Playboy bunny all along. Now it is a big car, and there's no escaping it, but it looks stunning in this beautiful shade of verdant green. And it's got real road presence. Somehow Bentley have managed to take this terrible modern design trend for oversized grills and really make it work. These headlights are simply art. And if you didn't believe me that this is a big car, those wheels, they're 22 inches. And compared to my normal daily driver, a Honda S2000, admittedly a fairly small car, this is eight inches wider. Even the key feels pretty colossal, but there is a definite upside to the sheer size of this thing. There are usable back seats, and more impressively to anyone that's ever been in an Aston Martin, even the boot actually has useful space, meaning you can go away for more than a short weekend in it. Not bad. Now, the hallmark of any old-school Grand Tourer was always the presence of a big-capacity multi-cylinder engine up front, and this one is no different. This is a twin-turbocharged 6.0-litre W12, and it's got ample power to move along this two and a quarter ton slab of leather and chrome. But with a starting price of £160,000, you'd expect it to be just as luxurious on the inside as it is stunning on the outside. And boy, do Bentley deliver. This is properly nice. The specification is cricket ball red leather with a liquid amber over gloss black trim. There is leather and chrome everywhere. Plenty of the switch gear is familiar to anyone that's been in a recent Audi or Porsche, but there is plenty that really raises it above the level of its VW stable mates. So many little details like this diamond in diamond stitching, the sheer quantity of leather and the feeling of solidity you get from the whole thing. The party piece for many people is this rotating display in the middle. Yes, it's nearly a £5,000 option, but the theatre it brings is really something magnificent. And it's little details like that that I think really make the Bentley stand out. Now, if you weren't aware, it means that you can have the display either hidden away entirely, you can have the regular sort of Porsche Audi looking VW display, or you could have a trio of very high quality dials, which are a temperature gauge, a compass, and oddly, a lap timer. There are some drawbacks though. The nearly £7,000 name Hi-Fi is sure to impress 
anybody that's never heard a great stereo before. That's not to say that it's bad, it's decent enough, and I like the fact that it's lacking any sort of terribly gimmicky DSP modes, but it's just not worth the money that they're asking. At two or three grand, I would say it's an essential option to tick, but I can't help but think you're paying another three and a half thousand pounds on top for the badge and the slightly nice grill, which isn't even replicated on the tweeters up here. Incidentally, if you do want to hear a genuinely mind-blowing stereo, give my friend James at DB Hi-Fi a call. He's got some systems that will genuinely tickle your soul. The beautiful gear lever down here, which is nice to hold, has evidently been styled by somebody that never actually had to use it, because it's very, very easy when moving into reverse to accidentally put the car into park instead. And that means that when you're trying to maneuver about, as I often am on these kind of tests, you wind up looking like a pillock. One piece of spec missing from this car, but that I know others have had, is a wireless charger for your phone. And that really should come as standard, I think. There's no excuse for it to not, not in 2020. You see, unfortunately, although this cabin is full of leather, it also feels very hard. It doesn't have that sort of soft, warm edge that old school Bentleys like the Brooklyns I reviewed do. It feels like it's going to last a million years, but it's just not so welcoming. Even the steering wheel is full of all these edges that just feel a little bit odd in your hand. And your left leg is always stuck between this very sharp transmission tunnel and this odd pocket here. It looks useful and it's a good oddments tray and you can put your phone there, but you wind up sort of with your knee kind of stuck between it and it's just not very comfortable. And I noticed it after five minutes and I, I can't believe that nobody picked up on that. A little bit of extra padded leather would have sorted the problem just fine. And of course, as you know, when it comes to any car like this, all the luxury in here didn't come as standard. There is an options list. Now the rotating display and the stereo account for about 11,000 pounds between them. On top of those, this car also has the essential Mulliner driving specification, an option that nearly everybody ticks and one that confuses me greatly for a couple of reasons. First off, it may be called the driving specification, but nothing really in it actually enhances the driving. You've got the 22 inch wheels here, you've got the perforated leather headlining, that diamond and diamond stitching, you've then got sports pedals and metal oil and fuel filler caps. The fuel filler cap doesn't even really feel like actual metal, so that is something of a disappointment. That pack is 10 grand. That seems a, a little bit steep to me, but seeing as it's so popular, you probably do have to order your car with it, and, and that is a shame. You then have a city and touring specifications, and again, between them, those cost about another £10,000, and they feature a huge amount of stuff that I really don't care for, including the Bentley Safeguard, which is Bentley's name for that system that so many cars have now, which I think runs about a 50-50 chance of causing an accident before it saves one but it does have some useful stuff. You've got night vision, you've got that great heads-up display, and a 360-degree camera, which is genuinely useful. There are also some more moderately priced options on this car, including the mood lighting pack and the seat comfort pack, which is well worth going for, because it includes the massage function. And on this, it's actually useful. It does a really good job, the same system as you'll find on something like an Audi SQ7. Truly brilliant. Now, all of this brings the Bentley's total price up to about £200,000. And I think that actually represents amazing value. I know that might be difficult to comprehend, but I've driven some very expensive Audis that cost, well, okay, a little bit less than this, but this does genuinely feel like a lot more car. Next month, I have a Ferrari GTC4 Lusso coming. And although there are some key differences between this and that, the Lusso is £130,000 more expensive than the Bentley. Now there is unfortunately, because of things, a big part of this review that was meant to happen that sadly didn't. I was supposed to start this at the factory in Crewe, where I was going to be able to show you how these cars are made, the amount of real proper craftsmanship that goes into them. I had a tour booked of the wood room. I was gonna see how this W12 engine is put together, and unfortunately, 
that all simply can't happen. One day it will, and I promise you will be taken along for the adventure. But something about Bentley that I think elevates them straight past all of their other Volkswagen stable mates is the amount of personalization you can have with one of these cars and the amount of customization that you can go to without having to do the special thing, you know, without having to go the MSO route, the Q route, the Ferrari tailor-made route. If you don't believe me, go on Bentley's configurator. It's one of the best and most in-depth I have seen. Only really, I think, Aston Martin can compete in terms of standard options. Perhaps maybe Rolls-Royce too, but I just really don't like the Rolls. I don't know why, I just don't. Now, if this were a review based simply on the way that the car looked, I would already be giving it an emphatic two tums fresh. But it's not. A Bentley needs to drive well. So does it. Well, it's complicated. If all you want to know is, is this Bentley fast? Then that's a resounding yes. That six litre W12 puts out some 630 horsepower and 900 newton meters or 660 odd pound foot of torque. I have counted them, they are all there. This thing is seriously, unbelievably, Supercar baitingly quick. Nothing this heavy has any right to move down a road in the way that this does. However, my audience, I believe, are a little bit more nuanced. I think you're all a little bit more picky, like me. Being fast isn't enough. It's about the way that the car talks to you, about the way it interacts with you, and that's where it gets very difficult. You would think that a six litre twin turbo W12 would have no issue whatsoever pushing out just over 600 horses, and that those turbos really would be a simple accompaniment, a bit of a starter, that they wouldn't really be doing much, they'd be there for show as much as anything else. After all, 14 years ago, Ferrari were getting this power out of a naturally aspirated engine of the same capacity. However, the Bentley, I'm sad to report, seems to have suffered from this recent disease which has been afflicting so many other Audis and Porsche products. There's quite a bit of lag in here. Now, allow me to demonstrate. This engine puts out peak torque from allegedly 1,350 RPM. I am at just shy of 2,000 RPM. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be even fairer on the car. 2,500 RPM. I'm doing 50 mile an hour in fourth gear. So, I'm on, I'm on part throttle. I'm not off throttle. So, I'm going to put my foot down now. And there's a little bit. And there's full power. That, that, that's, that's quite a delay. It's not quite Audi SQ7 bad. But it's not far off. Now, I have no doubt that somebody right about now is cracking their fingers and readying a comment telling me that I'm out of the boost range even though it's quite obvious from the specs that I'm not. So I'm going to do the test again and I'm going to do this in second gear at 30 mile an hour at three and a half thousand revs. Three and a half thousand revs in a car which goes to six. So ready, foot down now. There's the power. That's quite a delay. Might seem like very little but if you're a real driver it's a lot. Anyone out there that plays video games will know that a lag, which is the delay between you telling the computer you've done something and the server on the other end acknowledging that, is kind of significant. It's measured in milliseconds and anything more than about 40 or 50, you know, a fraction of a second, can really ruin the game. Lag of 0.1 of a second can entirely ruin a pleasant experience. Now, 0.1 of a second for turbo lag would be nothing, but this has a lot more than that. In of itself, that wouldn't be a problem. I was very surprised with the way that this rode. I did expect it to be more comfortable than it is. Now, of course, you have the obligatory bevy of driving modes. There's relatively few of them. You have Comfort, you have Sport, you have Bentley, and you have 
custom. Now I'm driving in custom mode for one simple reason, that's so you can get the odd bit of exhaust sound. As with all modern cars, Bentley have had to tone down their exhausts, but I don't think like Jaguar, like Porsche, like Ferrari or McLaren, that they've really suffered as much because I'm not sure I want a Bentley to be any more vocal than this. You can hear it just woofling away in the background, trying to do some artificial farts and pops and things. It's a little bit out of character for a car like this, but I'm not worried about not being able to hear the car. It does create a small issue I get onto in a little bit. In truth, sport mode ruins this car. Simple as that. I know I've said it for very many cars because it's true for very many cars. The only two modes you really need in this car are Comfort and Bentley. And there is a difference between the two, not a big one, but there is a difference. Now the gearbox in this car isn't the sharpest, but it's quick enough. It's an eight speed dual clutch item. The reason it has a dual clutch, I believe, is simply because this platform shares with the Porsche Panamera. The 8-speed in the 911 I don't really like. This may be a different unit, but it works well here because in a Bentley, I'm not too worried about fast gear shifts. I want them smooth, and at all times, they are indeed smooth. Even when it's doing them a little bit quicker, they're still very, very well judged. And this car around town is fine. I have driven a few cars recently that are near lethal at low speeds because there's such a delay when it comes to pulling out of junctions. This no trouble at all. As a cruiser around town, pretty well judged. Unfortunately, and remember what I was talking about at the start of this video, building a Grand Tourer involves trying to get a whole bunch of opposing concepts to all marry up. You see, unfortunately, modern people seem to think that physics is something that doesn't really apply to the products that they buy. Because I'm sure everyone buying a Continental GT expects it to be nice and soft and quiet and comfy and wafty, but they also want it to be able to put in a blistering Nürburgring time. And that's just not something you're going to be able to achieve at the same time. Never going to happen. So Bentley have had to compromise. And I personally feel like they've erred on the side of sporty just a bit too much. There's an unease to the ride in this car. There's a, there's a real firmness that's always there. Now, the good news is that this car is evidently extremely rigid. There are no creaks, there are no rattles, there are no squeaks. This is still a very nice cabin. There is, of course, a decent amount of tire roar on occasion from those 315 section tires, but it's not as bad as it might otherwise be. You've also got double glazing in here too, which does help a little bit. And for motorway journeys, this is a very, very fine car. That, that, that slightly awkward shape here doesn't help, but otherwise, decent car. And what is incredible, and this is quite different to some of the Audis I've driven recently, there is a lot going on up ahead to try and make this engine more acceptable to the world of 2020. But they have achieved one thing. Over the course of this test, so nearly 400 miles, I have averaged 26 miles to the gallon. Driving up to Oxford yesterday, I got just shy of 30. For a 2.3 tonne, 600 plus horsepower, 12 cylinder car, that is incredible. Absolutely amazing. That's sheer witchcraft. I know there's all sorts of stuff going on up ahead, like cylinder deactivation and so on and so forth, but I didn't notice any of it. And so that is remarkable. I have some experience in cars powered by the V8, which is also an option in the Conti GT, most recently in the Audi RS6. And that didn't really do any better on fuel. So to be honest, if you're gonna go for a Conti, I probably would just go straight for the W12. Frankly, 
it shouldn't be able to do that. That is an astonishing turn of pace. It is ridiculous. But to be able to do that, compromises have been made. When you back off, the car doesn't. Now, I'm not saying that it's some hyper alert, twitchy beastie like a Ferrari F12. Far, far from it. And if we look at the car's name, and the name is important, the Continental GT, if you want something to get you from here to the Stelvio Pass, it's an excellent car, truly one of the best, especially on European tarmac, which has a tendency to be a little bit better than our own, and I'll admit that this is not really the correct road to be testing a Conti GT. But I don't want to test this car on the A1, that would be boring. I have done a couple of hundred miles on the motorway in this car and it's fine. The stereo, like I said, is okay. I love playing with the display. The sat-nav is good. The HUD is clear. For doing daily stuff, this is a really, really good car. To hustle though, the main thing you have to be aware of is the sheer scale of it. I am taking up all of this road, every single bit of it. And the main thing that I'm hoping right about now is that nobody else on this road has a Conti GT. Or if they are, they're going the same way as me. Now I should really talk about public perception because when you're buying an expensive car like this, certainly in the UK, it is important to a lot of people. And I'm pleased to say everyone loves the Bentley. I couldn't believe it. Everywhere I parked this car, people were remarking upon it. My grandmother saw it and she's the sort of person that doesn't really know what an internet is or what it is that I do on it. Reasonably convinced she thinks I'm a gigolo. Not entirely sure. She probably thinks that's why there's so many different cars in the driveway all the time. But even she thought that this was a beautiful car. That, that doesn't happen. My neighbors love it. My friends love it. Random strangers comment on it, especially that paintwork, which I think is superb. Now I did have a Continental GT booked in previously as I alluded to and that was going to be a very different specification. In fact the car I was supposed to get was the one that Mr JWW recently reviewed which had a cricket ball red exterior. I've got to say I'm actually quite happy that I got this car because that one didn't have the name I believe and this one is spectacular. It is the correct colour for a Bentley. The road presence this thing has is just absolutely staggering. It's so authoritative, but classy. They've really worked miracles with that styling. The fact that I'm even interested in a Conti GT is a miracle. So other things to note. One issue with this car, not at all unique to the Conti GT, is because that exhaust is so quiet, a bit like the Audi RS3 I had a couple of years ago, if you're trying to change gear yourself, which I am, Sometimes you can't tell when you really need to change. Now, that's a problem if you've got the window down. Window up is fine, because you can hear it nicely. And it is a pretty good gear shift. The paddles are all right, they're not the best, but in fairness, in a Bentley, you wanna be letting it change its own gear. Just, just do. It's got so much pull, it really does. And Actually, the harder you drive it, the better the suspension gets, which is so frustrating because most of the time you're not driving a car this hard, but this is the price to pay for having some sort of body control in a 2.3 ton car. It's got the 48 volt active anti-roll system that's appeared in a number of Audi and Porsche products of late, and it works very well indeed. Custom mode is odd because it doesn't really have much customization available to it at all. You've got engine and gearbox, you've got steering, and you've got suspension. That's it. I would have thought there would be a little bit more. But in truth, if all this car had available to it was the Bentley mode, it would be fine. It would be absolutely fine. Uh, let me show you what second gear does because it's ridiculous. Come on, give me a second. Guy whips along. Also, for some reason that I can't possibly fathom, it's now only doing 10 to the gallon rather than 30. Oh, it does. Did you?
did you hear that? It occasionally does. I think what's happening is it still wants to change up itself, and I'm pressing up at pretty much the same time as it, and so it's going whoa, whoa. It's it's all a little. It's getting its snickers in a twist. I think. Is the Bentley Continental GT W12 a perfect car? No. Is it a very, very good car? Yes. Let's conclude, let's wrap things up now. I talked earlier about how you look at each individual element and then the key is how they come together. And that really is where the Continental GT does stumble. Because let's take that engine, let's look at it in isolation. It's got ample power, ample performance. Yes, there is some delay, some turbo lag. It's not unusual in that department. And for a big continent cruising car, I could forgive those characteristics entirely. The old Brooklands wasn't really any different and it suited that car just fine. The chassis, it's a little firm, firmer than I'd probably like, but it enables you to go down a lane in a way that you probably shouldn't be able to in something this heavy. In of itself, that's okay. But in my mind, that chassis deserves to be paired to an engine which is far more responsive or look at it the other way, and that engine needs to be paired to something that is a little bit softer, a little bit plusher. If, for whatever reason, Bentley do choose to lend me another press car, I would like to get the Flying Spur, because that is the car which should be set up a little bit softer. That's the saloon version of this, and it's, in some ways, the replacement for the outgoing Molzan. And that car, I think, is going to be the one where all the elements do come together and make sense. I can't blame Bentley for building the Continental GT this way. I'm pretty sure they're constantly frustrated by all these people that expect a 2.3 ton car to be as agile and sporty as a 911. And the simple fact is that I'd be able to keep up with a 911 on those back roads. Easily. Easily. You'd need a proper card carrying supercar like a McLaren to get away from this thing. And that's just... That's just mad. Bentley haven't so much ignored physics, what they've done is they've snuck into its house at the dead of night, kidnapped it, taken it to a disused warehouse on the edge of town, tied it to a chair, shone a torch in its face and slapped it about a bit until it does everything that they say. It's really rather remarkable. Where the Conti GT scores so highly is in the practicality that it has, which in this segment isn't a given. The Ferrari GTC4 Lusso is probably the only thing which really is neck and neck with it. And it is a truly special thing to be in. For me, I must be getting old because I'd happily trade a little bit of that ability and agility for a little bit more comfort. But hey, it's not a bad package if I'm being entirely honest. Would I have one? Not yet. Not yet. Should you? I wouldn't blame you. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.